Hi, this is RJ Saunders on the campus of Glendale Community College, and we interrupt this program to give you a special news bulletin. Now, for all you future broadcast journalists out there, this is especially for you. Glendale Community College is having a new class, Broadcast Journalism 106. For more information, go to glendale.edu to apply or call 818-231-3765. Now keep it locked right here for The Gateway Show. Welcome to Gateways to Glendale College. I'm Deb Kinley, your host, and today we're meeting with Dr. Jennifer Krestoff, and we are in the college's planetarium. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. This is your cave. You just said cave. I heard you say that a couple minutes ago. It gets very, very dark. <laughs> it is the best cave on the planet, but it does get very dark in here. Uh, we have no windows and no glass in the doors, and that is so that we can um, project images of the night sky onto the dome, and right. it's a realistic experience for the students. Great. How did the planetarium come to be here? Um, well, I will say that was before my time. Okay. I arrived in 2006, and mm -hmm. my understanding is that uh, there was some fundraising and some um, requests for state and federal funds mm -hmm. to build a new science building, a mm -hmm. science building that would house um, the physical sciences, so physics and chemistry, oceanography, geology, and of course astronomy. And this planetarium was envisioned as part of that state funding to be built on the top of the Health Sciences Center when it was built um, much later, but when a few, uh, a couple of federal grants came through, uh, the planetarium was fast-tracked, and it was built between 2001 and 2003. So we opened mm. the doors late 2003 Great. And for the first classes. And um, school groups started coming in, I believe, in the fall of 2004. So that leads me to ask, what does happen here in the planetarium? You said school groups, and I guess there's more to that. Lots. <laughs> we have a lot of the astronomy classes taught in here. Mm. We have... Uh, a fairly small astronomy department, so I'm the only full-timer, but there are um, four adjuncts that I have um, that I work closely with. Mm -hmm. So we've got a great team. Three of those adjuncts have been trained to um, work the planetarium's computer system, and they get to teach their classes here in the dome. So most of the astronomy classes are taught up here in the planetarium. So this is used as a classroom as well as just a presentation facility. Then we have other visiting groups on campus that come through. We have ESL that comes in, so I work with some of the ESL instructors to teach the, the students English vocabulary that's targeted to a specific area, and this would be astronomy. Do you and know then what level in. ESL comes? Does that ring a bell to you? No. Pretty high level, I would guess, if you're Probably, talking astronomy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm working also with Julie Gamberg, who's a prof here, and she teaches a, um, English, mm -hmm. and it's a contextualized English class. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she has targeted astronomy as the context um, through which her students will read the English. Um, they have lots of questions, so I go to her class a couple times um, in the semester, and they're coming to the planetarium a few times. We have Armenian classes that come in to see, and French classes that come in to see uh, full dome video we have in Armenian and French, respectively, so full that they can Full dome video in Armenian and that. French. Okay, that would um, be interesting. So we have a number of different classes that have come through. We have some visual arts classes that are coming in to do After Effects, which is a full dome computer animation course. We have some <laughs> students who will present their final uh, animation piece on the dome. Okay. Um, physics classes come in here, geology classes. We've had chemistry in here. Exciting. So we try and get as many people through those doors as possible. How many school groups come in per year, per month, per I don't know? Groups, we have groups come in every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings. Um, the program started uh, way back when, right after the planetarium was finished building, mm -hmm. almost as soon as construction was done, the team who was here at the time started teacher training because the grants were to improve the science education at both the college level and the local school level. Okay, elementary and high school. So mm -hmm. the profs here were doing teacher training for the K-12 mm -hmm. um, teachers. And they came on campus, they saw the planetarium, and they just turned around and said, when can we bring our classes? How soon? So yeah. grade three, grade five, and grade eight are the grades that have an astronomy component to their mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we have third grade and fifth grade classes, and occasionally eighth grade classes come as well. So they come to the planetarium presentation, but of course the whole third grade group comes from the school, and we, we only have 48 seats. 
So we usually split the grade in half and half of the group goes down to the science center downstairs. Mm -hmm. And they used to get a lecture or a little video, but that the kids don't sit through that very well. Very well. <laughs> so Dr. Lecuyer, Jean Lecuyer, um, he's a science center director, he devised these hands-on experiments that the kids do. Mm -hmm. So we have two experiments for grade three, which is light and energy. Mm -hmm. And then we have electricity and magnetism as two activities that the fifth grade class is coming through okay. can do while the other half of the group is up in the planetarium and then halfway through the morning the the groups will change okay and it's working really well last year we had more than 5,000 school kids come through 5,000 that's wonderful so that's wonderful I always yeah. loved our school trips when I was in school and I never Field went to a planetarium though <laughs> well they like it the groups that um I'm challenging. I'll give them homework to do. <laughs> so I'm probably the only field trip that's ever given homework to them. But I have all I, you know, I'll point out some things in, in the sky that they should be able to see that evening. So I tell them to grab a parent or an aunt or uncle oh, or, you know, whatever adult mm -hmm. they feel comfortable taking and just look at the sky. So they point can recognize. out, point, mm -hmm. teach your adult what yes. you learned today. How wonderful. So. so Jennifer, please tell us, let's get this out of the way right now. What's the difference between astronomy and astrology? That is a good question. <laughs> and that is a question that um, I actually address in my first class mm -hmm. for every astronomy class that I teach. Okay. It's um, poorly understood, I think, for the most part. Astronomy is a physical science, and it is a scientific study mm -hmm. of all of the objects in the universe that are above the Earth's atmosphere. Okay. These are tiny dust-like particles in the solar system all the way to the farthest galaxies and quasars in the okay. universe. Okay. Astrology is the belief that the positions of celestial objects have a bearing or an impact on human lives. Mm -hmm. um, there have been scientific studies that have looked at the predictions made by astrologers mm -hmm. and have found them to be inaccurate. Okay. Um, but it is a belief system. Mm -hmm. So my position is if people want to believe that, that's their prerogative. But they have, they should understand that it is not a science and it's not based on science. Okay. Very so. good. That, that's pretty plain and pretty easy to understand. Yes. So we do astronomy here in the planetarium. Okay. We do astronomy here. So the planets and the stars and all the things that you said were above the Earth. Yeah, the Earth's atmosphere. Earth's yeah. atmosphere, okay. All right. There's a lot of stuff in the universe. There's a lot of stuff. So as I tell my <laughs> students, you know, you've come to a really tough class because we've got everything. Mm -hmm. Well, except humans. That's medical <laughs> science. So. Another question I have, well, I'm going to ask you lots of questions today, but what about the, um, uh, the space station? Do you talk about that in your presentations? Not that frequently. Mm -hmm. The space station itself is aeronautical engineering. So mm -hmm. this is going to be space engineering. Yes. And that's rocket science. Rocket and science. Okay. that's an entirely different discipline from astronomy. So mm -hmm. astronomy is, um, the way it's taught now, it's mostly astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Although if we called it astrophysics, we probably wouldn't get as many people walking through our door. Mm. But the the engineering of the rockets, whatnot, that's really rocket science, and that's engineering, and that's a, a, a discipline that I don't know that much about. Okay. So I can talk about some of the science that they do on the space station and zero gravity mm. experiments, mm -hmm. but the space station itself, I, I don't address. I can show pictures of. I've been outside. I've been caught outside looking up to watch it pass over at certain times. So it, that's kind of fun. Yep. <laughs> Are you or is the astronomy program associated with NASA or JPL at all in any way? Since I know that is rocket science, but. Yes, we do have some close collaborations with JPL, mm -hmm. um, which is just up the road from mm -hmm. the college. Mm -hmm. They do not have a planetarium on site and they come down to our planetarium to see the final product of their full dome visualizations. Mm -hmm. So they have animation teams that make movies of the science that the NASA scientists have discovered. Mm -hmm. And they want to get, being a publicly funded institution, they part of their mandate is to educate the public. And mm -hmm. they print uh, posters and send them out. And they do pamphlets. And they make um, little movies 
and longer movies, but one of the environments um, that is very effective for space education is a full dome environment. So when they make their full dome animations, because they don't have a planetarium on site, they come down and they do the final preview here. So I've got to meet some very interesting scientists from JPL. Yeah. And one of my colleagues who was talking with the researchers up at JPL, one of my astronomy colleagues here on campus, has said that they want to get a closer collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we may be seeing JPL scientists down here far more frequently, which I think would be fantastic. I think that would be fantastic too. They have some really great people over there and they're right in the neighborhood practically. So. They are. <laughs> they're next door neighbors. Yes, yes. Okay. So how is our planetarium different than, let's say, Griffith Park's planetarium or similar to? Well, we're similar in, in the sense that we both have these new digital systems. So long ago, if you went to a planetarium, and certainly when I went to a planetarium when I was a kid, there was this big black thing that would rise out of the, the floor in the middle of the um, theater, and very bright light bulbs would project the light through pinholes. Um, mm -hmm. I think and I remember that. that was how the planetarium system worked. <laughs> Griffith used to have that as well, and they still have that, in fact, but they also have a computer system, a digital system, similar to the digital system we have. And I liken this digital system we have to a video game. Okay. So there are these fly-through video games, and all the kids who come through the door know of Minecraft, which is mm -hmm. a popular one, which is a three-dimensional virtual world that they can navigate through in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So they lie back in these chairs, and they're looking up at the dome, mm -hmm. and they're like, we're in outer space. It's a really good feeling. The group that just left that was in this morning, more than half those kids had never been into a planetarium, and the lights go down, and they're... It's a little spooky. It is a little spooky. <laughs> but exciting, and, and then they get it's to see the stars. It's an environment and... that they've never encountered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, most classrooms don't get pitch black on purpose. No. And they see the stars, <laughs> and they're like, are we really there? And I'm like, well, we're virtually there. Yeah. yeah. So it's a wonderful teaching tool, because I can do and show them things with the projection system that you just can't do. Which isn't actually answering your question of how <laughs> similar we are to Griffith. Um, Griffith Observatory is a lot bigger. They get a lot more visitors mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. but their shows are set. How we differentiate ourselves for the school groups that come to us instead of taking a class to the Griffith is they're all live, and I can switch up the curriculum. Adjust as you go. Adjust as we mm -hmm. go. So mm -hmm. the two groups that were in this morning, they're both from the same school. One of the teachers had already discussed the solar system and taught that unit with her class. The other one hadn't got to it yet. Mm -hmm. So I can't give, or I could give the same show, but for the kids who knew all the planets and knew basic properties of the solar system, mm -hmm. I can challenge them a little further, reinforce the knowledge they have, and then challenge them, take them a little further away. For the other class, it's more of an introduction, so I can set the stage and give them some really good visuals to take back to the classroom and then be able to piece, you know, oh, that went there and this went there, and I understand, you know, the Earth can revolve and rotate at the same time, things of, of that nature. It's really awesome that you can edit and answer questions. Do you take questions during these oh, periods? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they're, <laughs> the, the polite kids who raise their hand, I'm like, I can't I think see you. I think your hand is waving around. I'm hearing a lot of, oh, oh, oh. But I can't see any hands because it's dark in here. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll blurt out questions. Okay. But That's exciting. But they want to know if there's a black hole in the solar system, mm -hmm. if there are aliens out there. And do you get questions about Pluto? What happened to Pluto? I do. <laughs> yes. Pluto was reclassified. <laughs> yes. Um, and the fifth graders today, I said, well, we reclassified you this summer. You okay. used to be fourth graders. Right. Now you're classified as fifth graders. <laughs> it's still out there. It's, it's still there. <laughs> a few years ago, a third grader asked me if we blew it up. Oh, no. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> I've blown it up. It's still there. Big chunk of ice and rock. We I love. call it Bob. Doesn't matter. I love the kids' questions. They're great. Can you tell us about the intern program here? We have a couple of programs um, <coughs> that are not formal programs, the way that some internships run. The NASA has an internship program, the Siri program, which is a very formalized internship program. But for students who are accomplished in computer science and computer hardware, um, we bring these individuals into the planetarium and they help me with the computer system. 
Um, Are they students, GCC students? They're GCC students. Okay. They're GCC mm -hmm. students who come in. They come in initially as independent study students. And for the students who um, really begin to love the dome and are dedicated to it mm -hmm. and show real enthusiasm for it, they can come back as paid interns. And they're paid through the Gauss Grant, okay. which is a Title, Title V, v grant probably, that yeah. is a federal grant that the, um, the college has. And so they get a great student wage for working on campus mm -hmm. in an environment they really enjoy. But we've got some of those students working to create new content. So to grab some content, some good content from the internet or to get a video that they think is particularly effective for the astronomy classes. Mm -hmm. And then they will have to encode that video onto a computer, render it for a full dome environment, and then slice that full dome rendered video for the different projectors that we have. So it's actually a really quite complicated process. Mm -hmm, I've, like. I have done it once um, so I can send the students on their way. It's a very time consuming process and unfortunately I don't have the time to do mm -hmm. it myself. So these are techniques, computer techniques um, and software techniques that the students can learn here in the dome. Okay. And there seems to be quite a, an interest because it, at, at first it was just um, people who were interested came in and now there's enough interest that we actually put a call out for applications and we interview the students excellent, and excellent. go there. How many interns do you have or have you had over the years? This year, over the years, usually four. We have two sort of junior interns who are just starting and they're the independent study students and then two senior interns. Mm -hmm. We had three just um, finish at Glendale and, and transfer out. Uh, one went to Caltech, mm -hmm. one went to the bioengineering um, department down at UC San Diego, and one is up in the physics department at UC Davis. So, sounds like they're the getting work good, in the planetarium good, uh, certainly education. earned them good recommendation <laughs> letters from me. But they learned a lot, mm -hmm. and I think they've learned how to work in teams. They've had to troubleshoot in a non-classroom environment. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a really interesting growth opportunity for them academically. Sounds like. So now you mentioned earlier that they have to, well, program the program, create the program, but how many projectors do you have around here? You said you have to slice it up to put it to We have it six ready. projectors. Six so projectors? one projector isn't enough to cover the mm -hmm. entire dome, 180 degrees. How big is the dome? The dome is a 30-foot diameter dome. That's pretty Again, big. different from Griffith, because mm -hmm. Griffith has the 60-foot diameter, I okay. believe. Um, so we have the 30 foot diameter and then we have the six projectors that put the images up on the dome. Mm -hmm. I, I was here when the planetarium first opened 10 years ago now, I guess, and uh, it was fascinating. And uh, it's, just, it's just so wonderful to be here when the show's going on. I didn't realize that it could be edited or you know, streamlined for a certain group of people. So that's always well. Exciting. They're live shows, and everything we do is live. Mm -hmm. So it's it's working the computer system. If I want to turn on a particular feature to show where the dwarf planets are, you just mm -hmm. click the dwarf mm -hmm. planet button with the mouse. Um, there's a so lot. So you're like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, but you're controlling everything. <laughs> Maybe not that yes. day. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I need to get myself a cape or something. <laughs> won't I? Um, it's really fun to do mm -hmm. and I've been it doing it for like. years but it always it's different every time mm -hmm. so it keeps it from being boring Good. I know yeah. at Griffith Observatory they have great presenters um, that are actors mm. LA is full of actors mm -hmm. and they read the <laughs> script so the script is consistent and the astronomy is correct every time they tell it and I've seen the same show and I'll see exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. This time when you come, it's always slightly different. Okay. And the nice thing about that is, given that it's a computer system, if there's new astronomy that's been discovered, if there are new things to show on the dome, the company that we work with, Skyscan, who writes the software, will send us updates. So I can update the system and then you know, keep okay. going from there. But I know the show that I see at Griffith Observatory, that hasn't been changed since the Griffith opened mm. back in 2006. 2004. When they reopened and remodeled. And Six, I think, late mm -hmm. 2006, yeah, after the remodel. Mm -hmm. I can keep it a little more current mm -hmm. and a little more topical. Okay. Um, pull in some Harry Potter and some, you know, Percy Jackson and, and things that I know the kids will want. The kids will enjoy, sure. Will identify with. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if they feel that, you know, their lives are up there on the dome, then they, they get a little more interested than perhaps they may have been. How 
many people have had their hands involved in creating the different performances, let's say, or the different presentations that you've had. You mentioned a company and then you mentioned the internships and it sounds like you're editing as you go too. So it sounds like a lot of different people have been a part of well, the, the basic the basic software is from Skyscan, which okay. is out of New Hampshire, and they have built a lot of domes mm. around the world. Okay. They did the dome in Athens for the um, the 2000 Olympics, mm. and they have domes in Beijing and Taipei all over the place. So they're an international company. So they are they have astronomers working there. They're always up on the latest stuff. Mm. Um, they work closely with the AMNH, which is the American Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. which has the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a famous um, <laughs> astronomer. Okay. So their astronomy is always good. It's always up to date. Mm -hmm. So I can use that. I like to take show videos in my college classes because we don't use all the, the projection system all the time for the college classes. I have lectures, and okay. I'll show videos if... I find things that are difficult to describe but explained well mm -hmm. as a video. Mm -hmm. YouTube often has a lot of these mm -hmm. things. Yes, they do. Um, we're an educational institution, so as long as we don't charge, we can show these things if we give um, credit to who created it, the, the creators. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can show some things of that manner. So we have we have the students in here. Um, we have Skyscan. I've created a few scripts, so mm -hmm. just little computer scripts that will mm -hmm. show things mm -hmm. in a timely manner on the dome. Um, but I'd like to see more done. We've had s students writing these scripts as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's been a team probably create other than Skyscan, within the planetarium over the years, probably about 12, 15 students okay. and instructors creating content. It sounds very, very fascinating, especially for those of you who are really, really interested in it, and it seems like a great project to have. Now, how can the public, the general public, get access to our, our dome? Every Monday. Every Monday. Well, the days change every semester, but there are half-hour public shows. The series is called The Afternoon with the Stars, okay. or An Afternoon with the Stars, <laughs> and the shows are from 12.30 to 1, Okay, which is designed to allow the college campus individuals to come because mm. that's kind of the college lunch hour. Okay. So anyone on campus can come and see a show and anyone from the public. Are they free? They're free. Free. They're free, open Excellent. to everyone. So far, the planetarium has not been full. I haven't had to turn anyone away this semester. Mm -hmm. I have had two in semesters past. Um, I'll leave a sign on the door that says, sorry, we're full. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so far, we're probably um, two thirds, three quarters full for the Monday shows. Okay. We used to have evening shows, but apparently the college is not a destination for a Friday, Saturday night for anyone, <laughs> unless you knew about the planetarium shows. Um, attendance was quite poor. Mm -hmm. I remember those why, days when you advertised them. Which yeah. is why we did the went with the daytime shows, mm -hmm. and that has been working very well. So I do have some regulars mm -hmm. um, who come in off campus. Um, do you adjust the shows? It's not the same show every week? It is a different show, um, but the show lasts for two weeks. So if you can't okay. make it one week, you could come the next week. So every two weeks is a new show. All right. And the shows are posted just outside the planetarium door here on campus and also posted on our website. So it's glendale.edu slash planetarium. <laughs> I don't know if you can have that flashing at the bottom. He will. <laughs> but that's uh, a place where you can get the information. And if the shows have to be canceled, any week um, for any reason, then that also shows up on the website as well as on the planetarium door. Mm -hmm. So I've had faculty take their kids out of school mm -hmm. just for that time frame mm -hmm. to show them, um, the bring them to the planetarium show. I've had people come in off campus um, bringing, you know, high school seniors. There was a counselor who brought one high school senior to see the planetarium show. Mm. Um, so it was, it was, you get a lot of people coming in. I have some visitors coming in a couple of weeks, so maybe this will be one of the stops. <laughs> that could that could happen. We'd love to see you. <laughs> Jennifer, why is our planetarium important to the school kids in the state? It inspires them. <laughs> uh, science in elementary school can be pretty boring. Science in school can be pretty boring. Mm -hmm. And this is an environment where they really get to experience it firsthand. Because while science is 
best taught with experiments and in a hands-on mm -hmm. fashion. Mm -hmm. Often it's taught from a textbook. Mm -hmm. And it, unless you have a good teacher, it is going to be boring. And you can say that for any subject. I had an amazing history teacher, and I have a love for history. I've also had some not so amazing history teachers. Mm -hmm. um, but I love history because that one teacher really made it come alive for me. This is an environment where I don't actually have to work that hard. Mm -hmm. It comes <laughs> alive and it inspires these kids mm -hmm. and it really gets them questioning and seeing and it really, you know, science is cool it is when cool. they make it to the planetarium. It might not be yes. so cool in class, but it's really cool here. <laughs> and the STEM disciplines, the science, technology, engineering, math mm -hmm. are disciplines that are at the forefront of you know what makes America great, mm -hmm. and we need more students going into those disciplines. Girls and they're not and boys. girls and boys, mm -hmm. and they're not. These disciplines are usually not as well. The, the classes aren't always full. Not well populated. Um, they're not well populated, mm -hmm. and it's a shame because there's some really interesting stuff that goes on, mm -hmm. and this is a place where kids can really get inspired to possibly go down those that that stem route yes yes it's part of the curriculum but it really comes yes. alive when you come to the planetarium yeah. to see it in person <laughs> well can people have private parties here or private planetarium shows we have had private shows in the past um, there were more private shows in the past when we had a full-time planetarium team member who was available in the evening on the weekends um, that's tough with some of our teaching staff and teaching schedule. Mm -hmm. That said, we have had birthday parties in here. Mm -hmm. um, we've had seniors groups come through on the weekends or in the evenings. We've had Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops come in to earn their badges or their belt mm -hmm. loops, their mm -hmm. pins. Mm -hmm. So we do have some groups come through, but that is an occasional thing. Usually people contact me directly or they contact the planetarium and they say that they're English interested coming through. Naturally, there's a charge for that. Naturally. Um, but for people who are uh, particularly interested, that can be arranged. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been here with the planetarium? I have been here since the fall of 2006. Okay. And, and where'd you come from? What's your background? How did you come to be here, Jennifer? I followed my husband across the country. <laughs> he is also an astronomer. He's working mm -hmm. at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. Okay. And we arrived here from Pennsylvania. So both my husband and I taught at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. um, for a few years, but those were temporary positions. Prior to that, we were both grad students at the University of Toronto. So and okay. I grew up in Toronto. I did my schooling in Toronto mm -hmm. and got my doctorate from the University of Toronto. Okay. So it was a roundabout route to get here. A roundabout, well. But here I am. Lots of people like being in Southern California, so. The climate, the climate <laughs> is lovely. A little bit different than Toronto, for sure. I'm from yes. Ohio, so I know that East Coast snow. weather and snow and cold and, oh. And humidity in the summer. Oh, yes, lots of it. Okay. Yes. Well, why don't you give the website again so people can uh, find you and the planetarium if they have any questions. Okay. The planetarium's website is um, within the college website. If you go to glendale.edu forward slash planetarium, that's where you'll find us. Great, Jennifer. Is there anything else you'd like our audience to know before we sign off today? Have we covered all the bases? Pretty much. <laughs> I think this is so cool to be here and thank you for taking the time out to share your experience and your planetarium with us. Well, thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> You're welcome. So that's it for another Gateways to Glendale College. Uh, again, we're always open at www.glendale.edu. And you can call us during business hours at 818-240-1000. I'm Deb Kinley, your host for Gateways to Glendale College. And stay tuned for another exciting program. We'll see you soon.